Oh, sorry. Hello, welcome back to the 80s. It's been a minute, hasn't it? I'm wearing this, I'm definitely back there. No, it's this. No expense spared here. Welcome to the Museum of Modern Toss, and have I got something to show you today, back from now, in the glorious neon decade. Let's take a look. Good afternoon, Tossers. Susanna and Belinda, my gosh, what a way to open. Remember, lads and ladies, this comes from the year that Five Star were big. Oh yes, even back then, on a tiny little floppy disk, you could store 50, 50 PAL pictures that you can look at on your telly, in your bedroom, on your own. This was photography without film for the 80s and it's entirely analogue. So it's no joke when I say that this, the video floppy, was the small one that smelled like a big one. Okay, okay, I'm gonna have to be that guy and this irritates the ever-loving stuffing out of me as well. So uh, I've only got 17 subs as I'm uploading this and one of them to my mum. So if you did want to drop me a sub, that'd be great. Alright, never ask you again. Alright, promise. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. You read that right, your boy here is an analog floppy disk system. In essence, there's not a lot to say about this. It just stores a single video field that you can flick through at your own leisure. But trust me, Canon and Sony, well, and a few others, had ideas for this system. And in their world, in the 80s, this would have replaced camera film. It didn't, obviously. It's a fun little artifact from the 80s to talk about, although this model is, I think, from around 1992, and this one was made probably right at the last gasp of this system, around 1995. Who would have bought it? Why did they use it? I have asked around, and I've asked some seriously clever people in the broadcasting industry, and not one of them can explain what they would have done with this. It had been well superseded by the time this machine was made, but there you go. Still interesting to look at, and this is probably something you've not seen before. Welcome to Analog Floppy Discs. Let's spin the wheel of random formats. Oh look what pops out, the little video floppy. Convenient, huh? Now the first thing you notice about this disc is that it is absolutely tiny. Compared to Sony's great triumph, the three and a half inch disc that we all knew and tolerated back in the 90s, you can just see quite how small this thing is. And whilst we're on the topic of three and a half inch discs, this is not this. Yep, this is the three and a half inch digital photography system that Sony made also with the name Mavica. This isn't what we're talking about. There's loads of great videos out there about these three and a half inch disc cameras, so go and check them out. And the ones in the other video won't look like they've had a bukkake finish like my poor old thing has. And as you can see here in terms of length, width, length, width, whatever that one is, is that they are broadly the same. And I even managed to find the original paint and if you want to pause it and have a look at the actual dimensions, but approximately 60 by 60 mil or two by two in Texan cubits. Using it is all really rather simple. You just push the disc in and hit play. To look through the images sequentially, you just have to hit these plus and minus buttons on the front, but I'm sure if you had the proper edit controller, you could just punch in numbers. The image quality, and I am only looking at this on a 9-inch monitor, is actually quite good considering it's only a field. The colours are great, and it is all quite detailed. Now, I know the question you're dying to ask, how many pixels is that? Well, of course, we are dealing with analogue here. So it's a bit difficult to say exactly how many pixels this is because it's not a digital system. If you were a high roller and using this in production, Canon did make some computer drives for these that could scan them and translate the analog waves into a digital image file, which come out at about 640 by 480 in NTSC, which is the only figures I can find. Here in space year 2024, we would call that 0.3 megapixels. But that was perfectly good enough for press and just general viewing that these were designed for. So why way back at the start of this video did I tell you that this little one gave off the distinct and musky aroma of a big one? Well, if Sony would have had their way, and Canon, this would have been the future of photography. 
filmless photography, not digital photography, because as we know, all this is, it's just an analog video field that's just recorded on a disc, just 50 analog fields running up and down here like this. And that's all it is. It's just simple as taking one field from a video camera and putting it on a disc. So it's not digital. I cannot stress enough. This is not a digital photography system. This is an analog photography system. Oh, but someone else didn't understand that even way back in 1985. See if you can spot the error. And also the shit chroma key. I'm sorry, I'd rendered that all out and I couldn't be bothered to go back and redo it. So you're gonna see some dreadful chroma key shortly as well. My apologies. Anyway, enough of that, let's move on. Okay, let's spot this over briefly with another one of Sony's great uh, failures. This is Hernia, my old Betamax machine. And if you've lifted one of these, you'll know why it's called that. Um, I think we've got an excuse here. Now, you may have got out of seeing his pictures, but I'm afraid you're not going to get out of seeing mine. Because I've got technology behind me and 50 snaps on this tiny little disc. So, no messing around here. Open this up, slot that in. Now, I have to admit that I did have something of a deja vu feeling about all this. But that's because the Japanese have been threatening for over two years to launch an electronic stills camera, which would enable you to take pictures like this straight onto the disc without the need for any processing. Well, they're still working on the camera, but the disc, as you see, has certainly arrived. And you're able to take pictures with an ordinary camera and an ordinary film because the manufacturers have found a way of storing a whole roll of transparencies onto a tiny disc. A video camera converts the picture into a television signal and that is then converted into digits and recorded just like any computer program will be onto a tiny floppy disk just inside that plastic cover there. But that was 1985. Oh, and did you spot the light? The camera had been promised since 1981 by Sony, who at this time were using the name Mavica to refer to their system and the discs as Mavipack. Apparently, it was going to cost no more than $1,000, which was hailed as quite a remarkable feat even then. Mavica was actually a reused name, having originally been attributed in 1974 to a what looks like a prototype video system called Mavica Magnetic Video Card. But we've dusted that off and we're going to rename it as Magnetic Video Camera. So 1983 rolls around and these cameras are definitely coming now, say Sony. Yeah, yeah, 100%, you'll see them soon. As the whole photographic community uh, simultaneously will start having very itchy chins. And around this time, several electronics and camera manufacturers all get together with Sony. Yes, they say, we'll use your system. And now it's standardised, we'll call it Video Floppy. And with that in mind, in 1984, Canon decide to take the piss a bit by uh, using this system publicly for the first time. At the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, in an astonishingly fast pace of 24 minutes per photograph, Canon's video floppy system was used to take photographs at the Olympics and transmit them by a plain old telephone line back home to Tokyo. And in 1986, Canon released the RC701, the first commercially available video stills camera. The first filmless camera. Look at that. That's one handsome camera. In 1987, Sony finally, finally get a camera to market, this old ditch pig called the Pro Mavica, six years after initially promising a video floppy camera. Minolta, Shinnan, Olympus, they all promised these camera systems and whether they existed or not, I don't know. I can find references to them being shown off, but ultimately the world is not exactly flooded with video floppy cameras. Canon released the Ion series in the early 90s, which were video floppy cameras, and these do still crop up fairly regularly. But these definitely look more like point and shoots with their fixed lenses compared to the serious cameras that were being offered a few years prior. This of course all begs the question, what actually was the point of video floppy and what was it used for? Lots of references say it did find a lot of favour in the medical industry for imaging, direct from cameras, storing patient records, endoscopy images, lovely. And a lot of people think they were used quite broadly in the press for being able to just go out, take a photograph and send it back by telephone. 
and there were loads of dress up bits for these like the drive there were modems for this system there were printers the history is quite deep i have glossed over a lot of it here and of course judging by machines like the one that we've got here surely somebody in broadcast was using it for production stills or graphic overlays I can't find anybody who did, but please, if you did use one of these systems for any reason, there are a lot of people out there who are quite intrigued as to who was using these and why. Anyway, let's go back to our machine in 2024. Right, I've set something up here and we can take a look at what this actually does. So we're going to record some stills onto this. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. People are always asking me, they say, Andy, how do you always get all the pretty girls down the disco on a Friday night? I'll tell you, it's because I can talk to them using my knowledge and arse-aching detail of broadcast video machines. Trust me, the girls love that. You don't need a square jaw and a Sigma grind set. What you need is a stack of old Umatics. With that in mind, I could have used something dull like a DVD for this, but I'm not. I'm going to use Digital Beta Cam. Here's one if you haven't seen it, also known as Length and Girth because, well, look at it. And we're going to mate this with its step cousin here, the tiny little video floppy. And I'm sure if you go to a certain website, that's probably a subgenre. Right, let's fire this up and we're going to use a Digital Beta Cam to put some stills onto this. And uh, if you know me, you'll know I've put on this. I'm all excited. I can't wait. You know what it is. Right, here we bloody well go, lads and ladies. Let's get this digital beta cam loaded into the machine. And yep, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have spotted the continuity error, the fascia. For the digital beta cam vanishes and then reappears again. Honestly, don't lose sleep over it. It's fine. I'm, I'm not particularly worried. That happens in this house. It's totally unexplained. Rock and roll this onto a frame that I want to capture. I'm just going to skip past a bit of her and some bloke. Allegedly they're still married, but um, not in my world. So we arm the record, find the frame that we want to capture and just hit record. It really is as simple as that. The machine then gives a preview for a few seconds so you can see what you've recorded. And it heads straight back to AE mode, ready to grab another frame. Or failed, we'll cover that in a minute. And with the recording armed, it just heads straight to the next track. So in this case, I can keep pumping and dumping frames into my Carlisle pile for as long as I want, or until I hit the number 50. Which I can assure you is very easily done. Where were we? Uh, anyway, you probably get the idea by now, so let's move on. Right, I've given up on the whole continuity thing now because my top's changed again, so is the angle. And the other thing you might have noticed is that I've lost nearly 20 kilograms since I was back in the 80s as well, so the whole thing's pretty academic. I'm going to show you some footage that I shot a few months ago now when I first got this because I had to open it up. Um, basically, because when you put a disc in it, it sounded like sweet with his dick stuck in the toaster. The poor thing was squealing and waking up the neighbours, so I did have to... Uh, open it up and lube, lube it a little bit anyway. So I've got plenty of shots of the inside and also if you're the sort of pervert that likes looking around the back of old video equipment, I got you brother, I got you. Don't worry, we're gonna be taking a quick look at that as well. If that is the sort of thing that sounds like absolute hell to you, chapters are below, just skip forward, all right? Now to many, opening the plug may seem the wrong place to start, but we're in the UK. And let's just take a moment in our day to reflect on the magnificence of that Great British Earth Pin. Look at the size of that. God save the King. Makes you proud to be British. What a whopper. Now you might wonder the utility of opening the plug. I'll tell you. Because this is a rewirable plug, you do tend to find all sorts of helmet wiring inside these where Uncle Bob's had a go. And there's something in here, whilst it's not strictly wrong, I am going to change. The conductors are all wired absolutely perfectly, as you can see. But that 13 amp fuse in there, yes, technically it is correct, but I can't imagine this device would draw that amount, so I'm going to change it for a free. I hate watching YouTube channels unscrew things, so here's a magic trick. In the initial voiceover for this, I went into arse-aching detail about what's inside, but I've quit that shit simply on the grounds that most people don't care. 
In the spirit of compromise, I've sieved out the lumpy bits and put them in callouts so you can look those up in your own time. Starting at the back here, there's a hulking, great big, huge linear power supply, so this machine was meant to graft for a living mother lover. Or, I guess it could actually just be a very low noise design. I guess if these were designed for medical or um, broadcasting duty, there might be a reason there's a linear in here. I already think I've detained you long enough, but we'll have a quick look at the main board. And uh, do you see this too? I only noticed this in the edit. On this main board at the top, it looks like there's a lot of signal processing going on, as well as some system control kind of stuff. There is another big board underneath this, but as there aren't many of these left and it's not mine, I wasn't prepared to start butchering it to have a look. Most of the ICs are identifiable on the top, which is nice from Sony for a change, but I'm sure on the board underneath a lot of the chips are running in incognito mode. And in the words of Dave Jones, that's all she wrote. So let's sneak up on it from behind and have a look. Now there's even more here than you're expecting, or fewer things here than you're expecting. On the left hand side it's all dead simple, it's in out analogue, you've got S-Video on the far left, uh, plain old composite video, and then RGB, which to me at least screams that this was meant to be interfaced with a computer. The geeky stuff's in this centre section, there's a serial connector port here, which I'm sure allows you to connect it with some sort of edit controller or a vision mixer. Uh, what have you, not really my area. The wireless switch simply turns off the IR clipper on the front so you can have it clippable or not clippable. Sync deals with a studio clock generator if it was part of a broadcast system so that everything's tied up and in time. The switches deal with some basic initialization settings that you'd want to set and forget. One of these I think is just a general purpose controller for interfacing it with TBCs and the like. There's foot switch which fires the shutter, I'm assuming, or record. And strobo, which sounds Australian, which, taking an educated guess, would be to fire some sort of strobe or flash gun for photography. And a transformer tap switch so you can keep a bit of stress off of the linear regulators. And the minor controls on the front are all pretty self-explanatory. You can select your input type. You can turn field recording on or off. If you did want to record a frame, high bands are later enhancement. It's a bit like SVHS. It shifts the luminance carrier up and gives it a useful bit of extra bandwidth. Adjust the autoplay timing with this pot. As you can see, I don't know if it's this machine or the format, but you do get a lot of generally unwanted cack encroaching into the picture when you record a frame as it's hopping between two fields on the disc. Recording a frame will cost you two tracks and a completely pointless composite output check does show it does give us a nice clean pal output. Oh and by the way if you replay a field it just hops between upper and lower it's not doing like a progressive pal effect. There is a one field delay in there. Well we've had a chuckle haven't we? There is only so much I can say about this thing as lovely as it is it is basically a still frame recorder. With that in mind, just as I was assembling this video, I was having a chat on the old doobly-doo with some clever dicks, and they've pointed out that the disc is probably a lot more complicated than what I initially thought it was. So I need to do a bit more research and do some After Effects and stuff, because it's going to need some diagrams to explain how this takes the image and actually puts it on the disc and reads it back again. That will be a part two if you're interested. If you're not, you've seen the basic core concept of what it does. I hope you've had a laugh. I have got lots and lots of things I'd love to share with you. So please do subscribe and uh, pop back and see me again another time. All right. Otherwise, cheers for staying and uh, see you again soon.